What screen can y'all see? The starting shortly. Okay. Slide. According to my clock, we're at the top of the hour. So this seems like an appropriate time to stop, start if, if it's okay with everybody else. I love seeing like, hello from uh, hello. I can't keep up with it. So uh, welcome to all of you that are here. My name is Howard Sublet. I'm the Chief Product Owner, CEO of Scrum Alliance. My team asked me to host this, I'm pretty sure, because everybody else said no. So I... <laughs> 
I'm really happy. Like this is a, a second in our series for agile um, uh, leadership agility, uh, advancing leadership agility. And we're going to be talking today about different agile leadership styles. So we have three presenters for you today. Um, we have Sabina Candid from uh, just outside of Munich, Brad Swanson, who lives in Colorado and swims in cold rivers, and <laughs> Judith Umless, who is right now over in Pennsylvania. So we're going to take them in order. We're going to have each one of them present a little bit for you, maybe 10 minutes or so about what that they see as agile leadership style. And then we're going to spend some time in a kind of a fishbowl discussion at the end. So we're going to start with Sabina. Now, Sabina is a certified scrum trainer, certified enterprise coach, and a certified agile leadership educator. Uh, she became one of the very first German CSTs in 2008, and still, I believe she's the only female German CST out there. And she's a certified enterprise coach in 2011. She's been an agile mindsetter and an internal trainer and coach at Siemens and Alliance, um, working with many individuals and teams in business and IT, product development and management. She works at Improve. Is that how you say that? Improve? Yeah, um, she's an active part of the Agile community and she's a board member for our DOC chapter over there for the Scrum Alliance. I wanna turn it over to Sabina and I'm gonna turn my camera off and everybody else will and then we'll give her the floor for around 10 minutes or so. So thank you all for joining us. Okay, yeah, thank you Howard for the nice introduction. Now I'm ready to go. As you have heard, I'm from Germany. The little lake that you see on my screen is actually something that I see when I look out of my window. So I'm living close to Munich. And yeah, I've just set my time box to 10 minutes, so I'm ready to go. So my, the title of my talk today is Leadership Coaching with Intent. You could put a question mark there. I want to start with a uh, my proposition, modern leadership is moving away from a directive style to a more coaching style. So why is that so? In the past, once upon a time, what was it to be a leader? Being a leader meant developing expertise to become very good in technical, functional or in a professional domain. It means or it meant having the right answers and knowing what needed to be done. And because the leaders thought they knew best what to do, they were also meant to teach others what to do, yeah? telling others what to do. And that is also sometimes called the command of on, and control leadership style, but I actually don't like that too much because it has such a negative touch. And we have to remember that in the last century, this style was very, very uh, successful. It was done by many organizations that still exist and uh, exist for more than 100 years. Yeah, and it led to very efficient organizations. Okay, so why couldn't that just stay like this? Today, we have different times. Today, leadership is about building organizations that are innovative and adaptive. You all know the world is changing much more and even faster all the time. That is something that actually led to the agile movie, movement in the last century, starting in software development. Now we notice that changes are everywhere. You just have to look at the COVID crisis pandemic that we are right in now. That is very fast change. And of course, people, we have to adapt to that very fast. So we have to see that the best solutions, the best ideas cannot come from a single person anymore, not even from myself, so not even from the leaders. Yeah. So instead of leading by ourselves, by thinking we have the best ideas, we have to encourage humans to contribute and thrive. And that means actually improving people thinking skills. So we work actually with the brain of other people. We help, help them to use their own brain better. And that is actually what coaching is. So what is coaching and why is it so difficult for leaders? Coaching means serving a client's agenda. I'm an ICF PCC certified coach, and that is very important that as a professional coach, you should not have your own agenda, but just serve the client's agenda. 
So you should rather ask and listen instead of sell and tell, like many leaders are used to do in the past. Maybe there has been a survey among many leaders. Maybe this is why it turned out that uh, coaching is uh, not really the favorite uh, leadership style of many leaders. Yeah, although leaders think they are very good at it, but actually maybe they are not. There are a lot of excuses that I hear from leaders again and again why they don't really do coaching. It might be coaching is too soft. Could also be something like coaching takes too much time. We would be much faster if we just did it my way. Yeah, or she is not coachable because maybe we don't really believe in her potential or we don't think that she can really improve or that it just would be better if we, the leaders, did it ourselves. And coaching without an agenda, or well, as a leader, I do have an agenda usually. That could be something like, I want to make my organization successful. Yeah, or it could be, I want to beat the competition, reduce cost, I want to look good. I want to have happy customers, happy employees, or I just want to cover, cover my ass. Yeah? So there will be an agenda probably. And this own agenda leads to fake coaching conversations. That might look like that. That is a fake coaching conversation. So uh, as a leader, I might ask a great question. How are things going? That sounds like a real good coaching question, doesn't it? But at the same time, I'm, th I'm thinking about my own agenda. And maybe I'm also thinking about the next brilliant question that I could ask. Yeah. And of course, my coach, she notices that. So I don't uh, look very authentic in such a conversation, in such a moment. So how can we do that better? How can we coach our coaches and help them to think better, but still have an own intent? Here's an answer from David Marquez. That is something you might know him. You might know these nice little videos about turning the ship around or have read the book. He says, if you want people to think, give them intent, not instruction. And that is said by somebody who was a commander of a submarine. When I heard about that, I was very surprised because for me, military environment was always typical for command and control. So I just couldn't believe that this comes from a military environment. So, but he actually turned over the, he empowered his people in his, in his submarine in order to make their own decisions. And just the one thing that he didn't uh, take over, to, that he didn't move over to them that was pushing the button. Yeah, so that is the responsibility that he still kept, but everything else was transferred to the team. Yeah, and this is even older than David Marquette, who is still alive. That is comes actually from uh, a similar way of thinking comes from Helmut von von Moltke. That is an old Prussian Feldmarschall, so also from military area. Who in German it's called Auftragstaktik. In English it's something like mission command, but that's not a really great translation for that. So what he meant by that is, he also talked about intent. Intent is purpose plus a desired end state. So in a mil military area or in a military environment, it is of course very important that soldiers can act on their own, even when they are cut off from the line of command. So for example, the intention has to be clear. We will attack that bridge in order to cut off the enemy's escape. Yeah, the reason why to do that is very clear and the end state is also clear. Yeah, but the details are left to the people. So this is very simple, contains only the necessary details. And in order, that is also something that Mold can knew, in order to make this work, this has to be built on trust and not on fear. There has to be an environment that the soldiers can really trust their commanders and don't have to be afraid when they do something wrong. Yeah. So you might know this uh, something similar, similar by uh, that because that is also very famously used by Henrik Knieberg's videos from Spotify, this uh, alignment and autonomy metrics when you have an intent, that is, you should have an alignment on the intent. So there should be alignment on what to do and why to do it. And then there can be 
a lot of freedom about how to do that, about the actions. Yeah. So leading with an intent, how can you actually do that? So this is an outline for a coaching conversation that you could have as a leader with a coachee, with one of your subordinates or one of your team members, for example. So the first step is to align on the intent of the conversation. There shouldn't be a hidden agenda that you follow. You should be open with what you really want to achieve, to achieve as a leader. The second step is enable the thinking. That means don't start with your own ideas. Yeah? Enable the thinking of the others. That might not encourage people when you start with how you would do it. So even when you have ideas about that, just uh, keep them away for a while. And then inquire about their perspectives, about their thoughts and also about their feelings. Listen actively what they are saying. And then, of course, you can share your insights, your experience. You don't have to hold that back. When you have something valuable to contribute to this, then, of course, you can share it in order to help your, your people with their thinking and also with their own solutions. The third step is empower action. So it has to be very clear what uh, the people you're talking with are allowed to do, what they are not allowed to do. That might be very dependent on the situation, on the context, also on the capabilities and skills that the people have. Help them to define achievable goals and also achievable next steps. Check if they have the resources. If they don't have the resources to do that, you as a leader can support them and then empower them to own the solution. If they have developed the solution, if they really have thought it through, then they will much more easily join, this, uh, own the solution than when they have the feeling the solution comes actually from you. Okay, if you do it this way, then you have a great present for your people. You can present them a new way of thinking, help them with that. And for you of, as a leader, you have done something for the agility of your organization. Thank you very much. In German, vielen Dank. Ah, uh, and your timer went off. How no. perfect. It's like, Sabina, you understand uh, how to respect the time box. So uh, leadership style as a coach, very, 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 very interesting. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Next, we're going to get to um, Brad Swanson. So Brad, if you'll join me up on this virtual stage. Um, Brad is a leadership, but before I do this, by the way, if you have any questions that are coming in that you're thinking about, there's a Q&A section in the bottom of this. I meant to say that in the beginning, and somebody's already putting that in there. Please do that. We'll curate them and we'll get them at the end. Okay. Brad Swanson is a leadership and organizational coach who guides companies to achieve sustainably better results using lean and agile principles. He's been a trusted advisor for executives, organizations around the globe. Brad is also a sought after trainer who has instructed thousands in his highly engaged learning approach. Brad is a certified leadership agility 360 coach, certified agile leadership educator, certified scrum trainer, certified agile coach as a CEC. He's a certified professional in agile coaching as an ICP ACC and a certified less practitioner. He's a member of the agile leadership journey of global federation of leadership coaches. Brad has been an agile practitioner since 1999, is former president of Agile Denver and co-founder of Mile High Agile Conference and a speaker at international conferences, including num numerous uh, scrum gatherings in the U.S. and Asia, uh, to Agile 20, whatever, about four times, Agile, Mile High Agile six times, uh, Agile Tour Toronto, Agile Palooza, Agile Development Conference East and West, PMI Mile High Summit, our symposium, and many meetups around the U.S., South America, and Asia. Oh my goodness, Brad, that's a lot for me, you to make me say. So, Brad, welcome, welcome, welcome. What are you going to teach us about today? You are muted, sir. Yeah, that's the phrase of the year, right? You're on mute. There you go. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for that. I was hoping Howard would cut that short and not include all that long rambling stuff, but I'll, I'll jump in. I'm going to talk about balanced leadership. So I'll bring up my presentation now, and I'll hopefully make it full screen here. Uh, let's see, balanced leadership. This would be a nice follow-up to uh, that excellent talk that Sabina gave. Um, so balanced leadership. Um, 
Howard already told you all about me. I'll, I'll skip over that part. Um, I'm going to talk about a spectrum of leadership styles here, starting with what we would call an accommodative leadership style. Um, fits nicely with that coaching leadership style that, that Sabina described earlier. So accommodate, uh, as, if you're accommodative as a leader, you're likely going to be patient. You'll inquire, listen, you'll, you'll demonstrate caring. You'll probably be humble and flexible. Uh, now on the opposite end of this spec spectrum of leadership styles, we, we talk about an assertive style. Uh, in this case, you're likely to be more persistent. You'd be more active in sharing your own thoughts. You're biased towards action. You'll demonstrate confidence, likely to be more charismatic and more focused. Um, so you might think that uh, as we talk about a lot in the agile world, servant leadership is entirely and always accommodative. Um, but instead I like to talk about creating balance and agility on this spectrum of leadership styles. So I view leadership as something that's situational um, and that different leadership styles are going to be effective in different situations. So the most effective leaders learn how to balance these styles and to be agile, meaning they can quickly shift their style as needed based on the situation. So we depict here this great leader who's balancing precariously on this ball here and has this ability to quickly adapt uh, their style based on the situation. So developing this balance, how, how do we go about doing that? So the first step is to have awareness. Uh, when I work with leaders, um, I like to go through a short survey and have them that helps them reflect on what is their dominant or default style. So as humans, we're, we're creatures of habit. We tend to just follow our habits and um, most of us will have a default style that we fall into here. Uh, so the first step is awareness. What is, what is my habit? What is my default style that I'm likely to use? Second step in developing this balance is have the intention, be deliberate. Um, think about your situation and work towards practicing your non-dominant style. So if you naturally by default have a more assertive style, look for appropriate situations to be more accommodative. Some leaders are naturally much more accommodative and they may benefit from being more assertive. So again, look for a situation where you can practice that non-dominant style uh, as a step towards uh, creating that balance. So just a few specific examples here. If you would like to practice being more assertive, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, more accommodative, um, here's a few things you might try. Um, more listening. Um, be present in the situation silently. Another specific technique, leader speaks last. Um, save, your, save your opinions for later in the conversation. Um, a lot of leaders have found it helps to write what you're thinking rather than speaking it out loud. Maybe someone else will bring that up, but this is a way to redirect your habit to, to be assertive in a, in a silent way. Uh, mindset is appropriate here. So if you enter into a leadership situation with the mindset that I might be wrong and with a mindset of curiosity, uh, this helps you uh, naturally be more accommodative if you have that mindset to start. Um, and think about the, the people, the human side of the equation here. You might think about how you can um, Acknowledge the humanity in the room, um, show that you care for people, uh, show that empathy. Now, what if uh, you wanna practice being more assertive here? Now, without going to the extreme of being that command and control um, uh, dictator type of leader, um, there are some things you can do that, that are on the assertive side. Um, make sure that the goal is clear. Um, I, I love the idea of running experiments. So um, 
Taking action in the form of an experiment, though, helps people understand that um, it's not a permanent change or permanent um, action. This is something that we're experimenting with and we'll learn from it. Um, seek a win-win rather than maybe just a, merely a compromise. Uh, Sabina talked about this, uh, create clarity. So when you empower folks, make sure there's clarity around what is that action item or next step. And along with that, what are the accountability mechanisms? Um, establish those to make sure there's follow through. Powerful questions can help here. You can, you can be assertive with the question and still um, prompt the, the self-knowledge you have in the person you're talking to. So an example here, what are the risks with this approach? You're asserting that perhaps there are some risks, but I'm asking the other, other person to consider what those would be. Uh, this is uh, what I'll present now, very similar to something that Sabina showed us earlier, uh, a, a, a specific technique you can use to have a balanced dialogue or balanced conversation. Uh, Sabina showed a three-step process. I'll show five here just to give it a little bit more nuance. So first step um, to help you balance these two styles, align on the objective. So if I'm having a conversation with someone, let's make sure we both agree on what is our objective for this, this conversation or this meeting. Next, leaning towards the accommodative side. Listen, this is where active listening comes in. Let the others speak, hear what their perspectives are. Then a balance technique here, clarify your understanding. Do I really understand what, what has been said? Does my understanding line up with theirs? Now we can lean a little bit on our assertive side. You may have some insights, some wisdom to share that didn't come out uh, earlier. Um, share those at this point. And then finally, empowering action. Um, just as Sabina shared earlier, make sure that the other person has what they need. Uh, make sure there's clarity. Uh, create those accountability mechanisms. All right. That is all I've got. So I will stop there. And I think I kept within my 10 minute time limit. And you didn't even have a timer go off, Brad. Right. That was very, very, very excellent. I'm seeing a lot of questions coming into the Q&A for this. And I'm sure we're going to have a great fishbowl discussion once that this is over. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. You talked a lot about an accommodating approach of leaders, uh, leadership style. So awesome. Thank you, Brad. All right, I'm going to see if Judith is ready for us here. You can drop Brad and uh, Judith can join us. There you are. Uh, I, I'm pleased to get to, uh, to introduce you to Judith W. Umless. Um, well, so uh, do what? <laughs> said it right. <laughs> I said it right, yay. <laughs> is a certified scrum master and senior vice president, author and trainer at the International Institute for Learning, IIL, a global corporate training company. Her books include Grateful Leadership, Using the Power of Acknowledgement to Engage All Your People and Achieve Superior Results, which has been accredited with changing workplaces and lives by making use of the seven principles of acknowledgement she developed. And she wrote, you're totally awesome. The power of acknowledgement for kids. I love that you wrote a kid's book too. Awesome. Judith, thank you so much. Present to us and tell us something about leadership. Thank you. I thought you would never ask, Howard. Anyway, I really am delighted to be here. And ever since I became a certified scrum master two years ago, I'm very recent to this whole movement. I saw that these two forms of leadership, agile leadership and grateful leadership are so well aligned. Let's just take the core value of agile, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That could not be more right on because we have to remember that every single person on a team, working on a project, working agilely or trying to, has a need to be seen, to be valued to be heard. And this is critical. And it does not happen 
a lot throughout many, many industries. And it's been my mission, my purpose to make it happen more of the time. So if we go on to the next slide, the typical levels of employee engagement in 2020, you'll see what I'm talking about. The Gallup organization does studies every about every two years. And the latest one was released in 2020. And you'll see that only 35% of the many thousands of people they surveyed considered themselves to be engaged. Most, the biggest majority were not engaged, which means they were psychologically unattached. They didn't really care about the outcome of what they did. They were there because they had a job. And then the 13% who were actively disengaged, well, they are often the people who stir up trouble or uh, don't have integrity. And, you know, so those people cannot be helped very often unless you can get them to the just unengaged state. But the unengaged, missing one piece, I maintain, and that is acknowledgement, which comes in the form of appreciation and also gratitude. So let's look at the definition of acknowledgement. And I really mean something very, very specific, and I make a lot of distinctions. And this one piece, once it's in place in a heartfelt and authentic manner, allows people to engage fully and completely and with excitement and passion. And you can't make them stop working at night. So acknowledgement is a heartfelt and authentic communication that lets a person know their value to the organization and the importance of the contribution that they make. And I just hear people come up to me after my courses, my keynotes, and they say, you know what? I left a job just because I was not appreciated. And I started to do surveys of that. And IIL did its own research on this subject of leaving jobs due to lack of appreciation. Always over 52% of any audience that I go to, have been to, and will probably ever go to, says they left a job for that reason. And I've been in audiences where we, we did an informal survey and it was close to 90% had left the job due to something that is so fixable, so doable. It doesn't cost anything. You just have to overcome a few things and I'm gonna tell you about what they might be. And you're gonna tell me, this is gonna be two way. So in the next slide, I'm gonna share my definition of a grateful leader with you. And the key characteristic is that they can show appreciation no matter how they feel. Maybe they're embarrassed, maybe they're scared, maybe they're uh, terrified of being vulnerable, but they let people know how much they value them. And this is on an ongoing basis. It's a regular practice, not because anyone says they have to, but because it's just something that either comes naturally or they have committed to making a part of their work behavior, their family behavior, out in the community behavior. And a grateful leader wants to know his or her people, the team members, as people, not just workers. And that's really important because everybody has a story. Everyone has a challenge. Everyone has a goal. And we want to know what these are because that enables a team to really produce a wonderful result. Okay, so the next slide is, are you a grateful leader? And um, Molly, I think uh, you have a little poll here. Yes, are you a grateful leader? Yes or no? And if not, What's in the way? Do you feel insecure about sharing your feelings with people? Because this involves feelings. Heartfelt means what you feel. Emotion may come up. You may cry. They may cry. They don't always do that, by the way. So don't get scared. But fear is another one. Uh-oh, what am I getting myself into? Are they going to hit me up for a raise? And, you know, on agile teams, we have to uh, lead 
with with influence with you know we don't have we don't have people reporting to us so it's how we can influence them jealousy is another uh item that stops people well if i tell them how great i think they are then maybe they'll think they're better than me maybe i'll think they're better than i am so these are the possibilities now do we see the results uh, molly can we can we see the actual quick results Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we have a lot of grateful leaders. And I want to tell you, uh, if you are a grateful leader, and I, I, I think it's wonderful that 78% of you said you are, then you can always enhance your gratitude and your appreciation of your team members, uh, of the people in your world. And if you're not, then some of the things that stop you are apparently insecurity, fear and a little bit of jealousy that's I, I so appreciate your honesty this is really important and insecurity is one that we can work with and we can change we can make you feel secure and what one of the tools i'm going to give you today will help you do that so let's go on to the next slide the appreciation paradigm i want to do a quick um teaching on this because People think they're all kind of the same. Simple thanks we were all taught to do by our parents, you know, and, and simple thanks are always appreciated. Great job. Thanks for staying late. Thanks for getting the report in on time or early. Recognition is of an action generally, and it lets people know that they did something that you appreciated. And you want them to know that they made a difference. So that was great, that they uh, really helped the team in some important way. Acknowledgement, though, is of another order because it's about who the person is as a human being, who they are and what they bring to life, to the team, to uh, their communities. And we have an obligation and a privilege to let people know that we see who they are because I have so many people telling me, I feel invisible in my job. I can't stand it. I'm leaving my job because no one knows what I do or who I am as a person. So we can fix that. And here's the tool that will help you. I'm going to run through it quickly. Um, it's called the five C's of acknowledgement. And if we go to the next slide, you will see the first C is for consciousness. And it's, it's, it's interesting how these five C's align rather well with the five scrum values or the uh, three agile pillars. You'll see, you kind of tested that as I'm speaking. Consciousness is being aware of the acknowledgements that are in our heads and that we... Uh, think about all the time that person is fantastic i couldn't live without having them on my team oh my gosh they're really super or i'll tell somebody else about it but do you tell that person well number two is you have a choice second c is for choice tell them or don't tell them and i would always advocate choice being yes let them know what's in your mind in your heart even if it makes you feel insecure jealous or embarrassed the third C is for courage. And yes, it does take courage to do this. It really makes people say, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to do it. I don't, I'm afraid to be embarrassed. I'm going to stutter. I'm going to stammer, but I'm going to do it anyway. And if you're familiar with the work of Brene Brown and the power of vulnerability, it's all about that. It's really being vulnerable is a leadership virtue. The fourth C is for communication, and there are a zillion ways you can communicate from Skype to skywriting. It doesn't matter. We have so many tools, so you know, so many online tools to communicate with. But it's not just a simple recognition form, you know, checking boxes. You want to share something that really comes from your heart. And the fifth C is for commitment. How am I going to make this? a part of 
my life, my work, and my community, everything. So those are the five C's. And I'd like to know just quickly, which of the five C's resonates the most with you? Which one do you feel is the most important? And Molly has a, uh, a little survey for you. Uh, I love that we can do this and get the answers right away. So consciousness, choice, courage, communication, or commitment. We'll take a moment. They're all important. You must have all of them to really make this happen. This little tool, which people have said has made a huge difference in their lives. And their work for sure. Okay, so let us know when we have uh, most of the polling done. And let's see which which are the which are the winners. Communications. Okay, that was number one. That's really interesting. And consciousness was. Uh, consciousness and courage. Now, interestingly, those are the two that I feel are most important because without consciousness, that stuff stays in your head. But it's all important. It all fits into a package. And communications are the ultimate goal. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so um, let me just show you a quick little, uh, I call it the uh, very nice little cheat sheet if you would uh, like to have it. This is a poster, a downloadable poster of the five C's of acknowledgement. And if you write to me at judy.umless at iil.com, I'd love to send it to you. And then also, I'd love to have everybody join the Center for Grateful Leadership. We do a lot of events. We have podcasts and webinars. And somebody, somebody among us may be a guest on our podcast, but we'll, you'll hear more about that. And uh, the last slide is um, just something I was very honored to receive when we talk about service-oriented leadership and grateful leadership and how they go together. The um, author of the authorized biography of Robert K. Greenleaf, uh, who uh, founded Servant Leadership, this person, uh, Don Frick, Dr. Don Frick said, like Judith W. Unless, Robert Greenleaf knew that you cannot build community, much less earn trust without acknowledging colleagues, expressing gratitude, and offering recognition. If Greenleaf was alive today, I believe he would say you cannot be a servant leader without being a grateful leader. And that's what I felt when I became a CSM. I, I just really felt the alignment of the two. And they do need to go together. So I thank you so much for having me here today. I meant to start my timer and I didn't do it. So I hope I didn't uh, go over dramatically. I wasn't looking at a timer either, Judah. So I, I don't know. <laughs> it felt about right. And if it feels right, it's the right thing, right? I agree. Thank you. I well, agree. thank you. Thank you for uh, your so kindness. Oh, thank you. And, and Brad and uh, Sabina, if you can join us back, I'm, I'm getting flooded with questions wow. here. So trying to parse this and figure out how to get to the answers for them. So um, might be a, a lot of fun. So um, one of the things that hit me just listening to the three of you, by the way, completely fascinating. So Sabina, make sure and turn your mic off because I know you're going to want to jump in here um, is three different approaches, a coaching approach, an accommodating approach to a style of leader, and then a grateful. They're not in conflict with each other. Did you all hear that as you were talking? Like I hear different people talk about styles of leadership and you all were almost echoing each other. Did you pick up on that? Yeah. Yep. Did, I did. Was any was anything that somebody else said kind of surprise you? How about that? Because you all haven't heard what each other said. I'm just curious, did you pick up on anything that that you would have, you know, so Sabina, did you pick up anything? 
Well, from from Brad, actually, I think we we have joined the same training, <laughs> so <laughs> the Kaltu training by Pete Behrens. Yeah, so that is uh, where I recognized a lot of stuff coming from, and I think that we use different words. So accommodative and assertive. I would I call that in my talk directive versus versus a coaching style. You could also give other names to this, like command and control versus servant leadership. So it's always about the two different ends of an axis being very directive, telling people what to do and vice versa. The other hand would be leaving a lot of freedom, giving empowerment to people and having people solve problems. Yeah, so that actually, yes, for from I think from Judy, there was were a lot of new things for me. So thank you to Judy. Oh. That was, yeah, really new for me and an interesting perspective. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I just want to say um, the term balanced leadership I found intriguing. And I people sometimes say to me, well, how can you give people criticism if you're just acknowledging them? I And first of all, I never say to acknowledge them when you're not feeling it, when it's not authentic. It must be authentic. But in a context a climate of appreciation then you have that balance you can give constructive criticism because people want to grow they beg for it and you must give them the appreciation letting them know that they are valued and valuable and that they exist so yeah that was that was very interesting yeah i'll i'll i'll, I'll drag brad in here for a little you brought balance approach and i was interested when it when he talked about a balance approach for what your dominant style is, how do you know what your dominant style is? And, how, you know, um, I'm, I, it made me think about myself because I think I know, but I'm not sure. And how do I know whether I'm in balance or not? That whole, you know, Dunning-Kruger of not understanding who you are. So do you have any tips for those kind of things when you talk about that? So, so certainly you can, you know, examine those characteristics of being assertive and accommodative and, and make your own assessment, um, but you're right, Dunning-Kruger applies here. It, it can be useful to ask others and get that feedback from people you interact with to, to get their perspective on, on what your default or dominant style is. So you're not uh, deluding yourself into thinking you're one when you're actually perceived as the other. Um, I do a, a short survey that I use with people to help get at that as well, but um, it's, it's not, not super complicated. Again, you can ask a few questions of folks and, and get their perspective. So how do you, um, I think one of the things that many people in companies, fortunately it's not places that I've been is, is that um, they don't understand that boss doesn't necessarily equate to the word leader. Like um, they just, there are many leaders that are not necessarily a boss or not necessarily your boss. And so, um, like there are people that are leaders that are not, um, don't have reporting structures. They're not necessarily connected. And how do you, how do you help somebody maybe that was, maybe that's your boss that you actually would like for them to be a better leader? How do you coach them? How do you help advise them? What, what, what should you do um, to help them see a balanced approach or more of a, how do you help them become more of a grateful leader or more of a coaching style leader? I'll throw it out, whoever wants that, it first. Yeah, that's something that definitely requires that vulnerability that, that I think we, that came up here. Um, uh, I think you have to have some trust with that, that leader or boss and, and then be willing to put yourself out there and, and ask some tough questions. Um, that, that conversation technique that I outlined that very similar to what Sabina used, I've actually found that useful if you're on the, if you are the, on the receiving end, say a feedback from a boss, you can actually use that technique to steer the conversation and try to get that balance of, of perspectives in there. Again, vulnerable, because you have to assert yourself a little bit uh, to, to steer a conversation in that direction. I mean, Judith, yeah. you've written books about this. You probably told children how to do this. So um, how, how would you approach that? So which aspect of what he said? Um, About trying to, trying to help reflect to a boss that, or to a person that's not 
the type of leader that you really need? How, how do you help influence them or how do you help coach, if you will, a leader to be that better leader if you're the subordinate? Yeah. Well, one way is to uh, print out a poster of the five C's and, and just leave it anonymously on their desk. <laughs> <laughs> I've known people to do that, <laughs> but sometimes they'll also say, you know, I, I feel like maybe appreciation is something we want to make a team value and how, uh, how can we do that? I have a few ideas because I just attended this wonderful Scrum Alliance webinar and I think maybe this is worth our trying out. And that's how you get, you get a conversation started. And some of them are, I've had people tell me that the person was, oh, I don't need that, resistant. But in other cases, they say, you know, I, I've been struggling with that myself. And I don't know, I feel a little uncomfortable myself acknowledging people. So maybe if we make it a practice in our meetings, start every meeting with, uh, you know, the five C's or who needs uh, to be appreciated today, who's done something that uh, calls for appreciation. So there are many ways to go about it. And uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to do some informal coaching. You have my email address. I'd be specific to a situation. I'd be happy to help. So somebody asked this question. I think it's, a, it's fascinating. Somebody asked, uh, can there be a command and control leader who is effective at agile leadership? So maybe I can, it is a little bit related to the last question. So maybe I can add to that. There was a question in the chat also to ask, can you coach somebody who doesn't want to change? Yes. I think, no, you can't. Because either there's an, uh, the pers a person wants to change because he or she had an insight that something is not like he or she wants to be. Yeah, then this would be a perfect candidate for coaching. And or there is a need coming from maybe the organization. The organization wants to become more agile, so that means leaders need to change. Or they don't find that he has problems with his team or with sub subordinates and cannot solve that on, on his own. Then this is something that is coachable. Yeah, if there's no will or no need to change, then coaching just doesn't work. Yeah, and that is related to the question that the second question that you asked that I forgot. So maybe you can repeat, Howard. I I forgot my own question. You asked you, you expect <laughs> me to remember my question, Sabina? Really? Come on. I, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, then maybe it was not so important. <laughs> <laughs> There has to be some sort of an impetus for change, right? There has to yeah. be something that causes the change. And it made me, Sabina, you talked a little bit about uh, David Marquette. And, um, you know, uh, if you haven't read the book, I'm sure you have, but some of them that are listening may not have, you know, that the, the trigger for the change in him was that he's assigned into a submarine he didn't know how to run. And so he had to trust the team to do it. And I, I always wondered if that trigger didn't exist, would he have come in and just told him exactly what to do? Or, or is it because he was in a completely different situation that he actually discovered that actually he doesn't know everything? Like, I, I wish I could have that conversation with him. Do you get anybody, anybody have had that conversation with David? No. Not personally, but uh, in the book, he says that this submarine was one of the worst that they had. Yeah, so that, that was a need for change. They were, didn't want to stay like that. So people were, were unhappy. They were performing badly compared to other submarines. And he took over the command of this submarine and said, okay, this is, I want to have this differently. I don't want to be the commander of the worst submarine that exists. Yeah? And so they, by changing his leadership approach, uh, they became one of the best, or maybe even the, the best, I think, compared to their, their peer sub submarines. So I think yeah. that is a very convincing. Yeah, and that, that might be because yeah, people were afraid before this change, they were afraid to talk up to him. And that is something that you see very often in organizations that people just don't speak up to the leaders, also not giving feedback and things like that, yeah. And that is, yeah, if you have a, we always talk about this atmosphere of psychological safety, I think that is a very 
important prerequisite for things to work. And that was even, as I said in my little talk, acknowledged by Helmut von Moltke, who was a Prussian uh, leader in the last in, in, in the 19th century. Yeah, that in the military you need to have this atmosphere of trust and respect and not fear. At least right. not from the commanders, from fear of the commanders. Yeah. Brad, did you have something? Yeah, I'd add one thing here. We, we talk about can can command and control leaders uh, be effective in an agile organization? I, I think one of the challenges, if you go to someone who, again, has built up that habit, if that's their dominant style, and say, you have to be a servant leader now, you have to be this sort of soft, squishy, um, you know, accommodative leader, that's, that's probably not going to be something that person is willing to say, I'm going to give up everything I've ever learned as a leader, everything that's gotten me to where I am today to become a totally different kind. So again, I like to approach this as balance, not asking a leader to um, become an entirely different person. We're asking them to have a little bit more balance and through that balance being actually more effective than they are with when they only have one tool in the toolbox which is that, that directive command and control style. Yep. Um, somebody's texting me and I'm trying to follow and that said, I missed the second half of the question. So has no one noticed that many of our examples today are military commanders trained and successfully in command and control? Um, uh, could, because a command and control leader could understand that command provides the vision, but control is entirely, ultimately, inevitably in the team. That was the second half of the question, I guess. Evidently, I missed the second half of the question trying to follow through. Does that resonate with anybody to, to help follow up with that? Hmm. One of the things, one of the things I noticed in, in like, when you start thinking about uh, things that are impactful in agile organizations, right? Um, some of the easiest to, to implement, some of the easiest things to measure are some of the easiest things to, to implement in a command and control style. Like for instance, ensuring that people are now working in teams, ensuring that you have like certain like roles or frameworks, like those are pretty easy and easy to, See, but they actually have some of the smaller amounts of impact sometimes at an organizational level. Whereas as you as you rise in that impact to things like an agile mindset, they they're the least measurable, the least they're the most difficult for people to be able to see and measure, and they definitely can't be led in a command and control style. So I think maybe it's somewhere in that spectrum of, of, of hierarchy over how, how impactful something might be to an organization over what style maybe that it was going to be needed sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that, that was, reminds me again of one question that I read in the, uh, in the chat, how do you achieve alignment? Yeah, uh, yeah the uh, command and control style with just you command something that needs to be done. Maybe you command the goal, yeah? And you just give people some freedom how to reach the goal. Another way would be if you have a coaching style, you inspire them to do something and help them by coaching to grow. Yeah, and I think if if, if you talk about a transition in a big company, there are actually two extremes. One is doing it bottom up, yeah, so on a voluntary basis, and the other one would be command and control to do it top down. Yeah, and I actually, for me, top down is kind of contradictory to to agile as it should be. Of course, I see I've worked in big organization for a long time that if you do it completely bottom up, you could wait forever, yeah, depending on the size of the organization. But the more you can do voluntarily, starting with, let's say, pilot projects, small projects, small teams who are enthusiastically and voluntarily because they always wanted to do something like that. And they will, there will be some followers trusting that people, that, this, that, that the world gets spread around the organization, that people learn from that. The more you can do with that, the more, I believe sustainable the change would be the less you need to do command and control yeah i think leaders are important in order to change processes and structures in the organization where probably teams cannot do alone 
doing reorganization, for example, to get to come from functional teams to end-to-end -end teams, cross-functional cross teams. There need to be leaders and there probably needs to be a portion of command and control, but the more you can leave to the people, the, the more agile it will become, the more people will learn. Yeah, one, Absolutely. There, I, I see a lot of questions about sort of how do you, how do you help someone who, who is that command and control style leader to, to shift their style towards, towards the opposite in the spectrum. Um, I'd like to start small and maybe think about running an experiment. And, and for a leader like that, ask, is there, is there one decision that you're willing to delegate to your team um, as an experiment for, for some short period of time? So, and maybe it's a very small uh, decision but, but that first step, if you can demonstrate that, hey, our team was, was able to make that decision on their own successfully, and uh, that, that then maybe opens up the door to, well, is there, is there another decision, maybe a slightly more significant decision that you're willing to delegate to the team? Um, so you can work on, uh, you know, again, successively more significant decisions maybe that, that could be delegated. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Judith, you mentioned something in talking about grateful leadership, this, this, this power of acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, and that how important that is and that it, it doesn't cost a thing. How do we get that so wrong? I, I mean, it seems so simple when you said it. And yeah. I was like, how many people have I acknowledged and said, thank you to today on my team. And so how has it we missed that one? Yeah, and, and that's what has that really is what drove me to write a book because practically every time I acknowledged someone, they would say, Oh, it was nothing. You know, anybody would have done that. And and I had I just couldn't stand that. And the other thing that I couldn't stand was thank you for thanking me. No one ever does that. No one ever shows me appreciation. And it's like, that was what really had me put pen to paper. Well, finger to keyboard in those days, in these days. And um, it was amazing how prevalent this was. And I said, this has got to change. And I, I, I once wrote an article when I was working at CBS television, called How Not to Talk to a Pregnant Businesswoman, which I was at the time. And <laughs> it got published by a women's magazine. I was on Good Morning America. And things changed as a result of that. People told me for years afterwards, they would just make a copy of the article and put it on their colleagues' desks. And I said, I've got to do something about this one. And every single person here, and I just have to say, when you asked me a question earlier, I have to admit that my attention was wandering a bit because I have been flooded by requests for the poster of the five C's and people have already joined the center. You know, I, I feel moved almost to tears by that because it tells me that it's still missing for people. And like you say, it's so simple. Why am I not doing this? And we have a thousand reasons why we're not doing this, but we have a zillion reasons for why we should. And the cost of not doing it is so high. And, you know, from people leaving to people getting sick on their jobs because they're just not feeling good being there, you know. And I, may I say one more quick thing? Uh, yes, in you the, may. the military uh, examples that have been coming up. Uh, I once initiated a contest for our Center for Grateful Leadership called the most creative excuse for not giving an acknowledgement. And the winner <laughs> was a, a former submarine na Navy pilot and or whatever the driver of a submarine is called. Is that a pilot? I, I'm not sure. Whatever he was, he was in charge of it. And he said, you didn't dare acknowledge anyone in the Navy because what was expected from everybody was above and beyond. End of story. But he became one of our most active members in the Center for Grateful Leadership because it was like he was thirsty, hungry for this. 
And, you know, I've trained in the U.S. Army and they I've had people say I'm taking this with me to the battlefield. I've trained leaders in the U.S. Army. I mean, it's a hunger. It it's is. Need. It is. And, and I'm we're at the end of our time box. So as such as us agilists try to is respect that time box. So I yes. want to be grateful for Sabina, for Brad and for Judith and for all of you that are listening and very grateful for my team back in Denver, Colorado, that helped put this on. Thank you so much for joining us today and make sure and look out for the next time that we offer another webinar. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Enjoyed it.